the founder of Near Protocol reveals everything. Today, we have a very special guest, Ilya, the founder of Near Protocol, where he will reveal everything behind what Near is building, and we will discuss what's happening in the crypto market. Welcome to the Bean Pod. This is your place for all things stocks and crypto. From beginner tips to expert picks, use this as fuel for your investing journey. Because when you're in the know, your money will grow. This episode of the Beam Pod is sponsored by BitGet. BitGet is the most user-friendly and secure crypto trading platform for both beginners and experienced traders. BitGet is the best place to not only trade Bitcoin and Ethereum, but also all the small cap gems that we discuss every day. With 24 seven customer support, leverage trading, and a wide array of other advanced features, BitGet sets itself apart from every other centralized exchange. Through Beanstalk's official partnership with BitGet, you'll receive 15% off all trading fees when you sign up using the referral link in the description. All views expressed by speakers on the BeanPod are solely their opinions. You should not treat any opinion expressed on the BeanPod as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a specific strategy, but only as an expression of their opinion. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Welcome to the Bean Pod. This is Shane, aka the Jolly Green Investor. And this is Josh, the Nifty Investor. Today we have a very special episode. We're interviewing the founder of Near Protocol, Ilya, who's going to reveal everything that's going on with the project and in the crypto market. Ilya, welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me. Lovely. So, hey, so obviously we've discussed Near a lot in the past. Our listeners are very adamant about knowing more about what what is near up to and maybe you could give us a little bit of a background about if for those who haven't heard about near protocol maybe some new listeners what exactly is it what problems is near solving and how is it different from other layer ones for sure yeah so our original vision really been how do we bring open web to you know billion or more of regular users who are not familiar with you know web3 who may not want or can figure out how all the technology works and to achieve that you really need to kind of build a lot of pieces of the stack and so we originally started with uh, the blockchain itself the layer what we call layer one as a way to how do we get something that's really easy to use scalable and secure and uh, that's where we started, you know, building sharded blockchain with, you know, easy developer environment with account abstraction that allows anyone to onboard and kind of not figure out the uh, complexity. But as we were kind of, you know, delivering that and building more, we started thinking kind of beyond that. And so right now we call it blockchain operating system because it's not just layer one. It has a lot of other components in the ecosystem that really composes into a fully kind of um, this environment in which people can build and use applications without really needing to think about which blockchain it uses, you know, what are the wallets, like all of this complexity that comes in right now with Web3, really abstracting it out, making it simple for everyone to use, for everyone to build on, and people starting to kind of build application that, you know, maybe smart contract lives on Mantle, maybe smart contract lives on Near, but, you know, the user starts from another blockchain. Like we're starting to see those kind of use cases where all of this complexity from user perspective is starting to be abstracted out. And so kind of the way we call it, you know, it's entry point to Web3, it's for consumers, targeting billion users, blockchain operating system. Interesting. So it kind of sounds like a lot of the, the ethos of Near Protocol is making it easy for people to build on it. And, you know, obviously blockchain technology can be pretty tricky. One of the great things about layer one projects when they start kind of making news is is making partnerships with companies and brands that people that may not be so technical on the crypto side can understand. And Near Protocol has has started to make some some pretty big news this year, gaining some partnerships with some some fairly fairly notable brands. There was there was Alibaba, which came up recently, and also even more recently, I, I read something about the Cricket World Cup in Near Protocol. Can you tell us about maybe those partnerships and a few other partnerships that you are, are really excited about? For sure, yeah. So maybe kind of just um, from a mindset perspective, right? Uh, there's two sides. There's one side, which is the uh, infrastructure partnerships. And so Google, uh, which we had before, and, and this Alibaba are really coming in as more 
yes, they are kind of in, in, in a way Web2, the core Web2 players. And the reality is as we build open web, as we build Web3, they're not going away, right? They're still providing the infrastructure and kind of the base layer for a lot of the uh, Web3 we're building on top of it. And the core change is that now they, they are not the moat, right? They're now one of the participants on equal footing with, you know, you running a node at home as well. But having these partnerships allows to have, you know, uh, kind of more people validating nodes, running uh, RPCs, indexers, data layer, kind of all of the stack that, you know, at the end we need to power Web3 applications. And so that, those are, you know, core partnerships. They also bring obviously awareness to the uh, project and allow the builders of near to actually, you know, uh, for example, run nodes uh, um, with these providers. Now, a different side of this is when we partner with, for example, uh, ICC, the International Cricket, um, and they are about bringing this to the user, right? You know, Cricket has a billion uh, followers. And, you know, with our mission of getting billion users, <laughs> if we can convert every follower to be a user, we're right. done. So, so the idea here is like, hey, how do we bring something that's useful, that's easy to use, that, you know, ideally engaging to as many people as possible and engaging with some of those big brands who have interest and uh, kind of a desire to explore and experiment uh, with this and, and bring a very real use cases to their uh, audience is extremely kind of important way to grow the user base of Web3 in general. And so this is where we're partnering to kind of create these connections and then working with them to bring some of the solutions uh, on top of the blockchain operating system uh, to their users. Right. So for, for something like the the cricket, the international cricket thing in particular, how does that work kind of behind the scenes at Near Protocol? Is your team find, trying to find brands like the Cricket Association, which, as you said, has a billion followers and reaching out to them to try to earn the partnership? Or are is the international cricket community very public about wanting to find a blockchain partner and then you guys kind of hear about that and reach out to them or do they reach out to you? Or how does that kind of the partnerships forming work from the background, if you could shed some light on that? Yeah, so so NIR has a NIR foundation, right? That's, uh, you know, the entity that is kind of tasked with growing the ecosystem, bootstrapping the decentralized governance and, you know, overseeing the kind of some of the processes in the ecosystem. It's not, you know, controlling it in any way, but it is there to really help it kind of start and get it on its uh, on its legs. And so the team the team there has a, a partnerships team which um, which is kind of both works inbound and outbound, right? So there is yeah. there's teams there's teams and companies and brands and and startups that are coming in and like, hey, we see Near is already partnered with this partners and we like Near right now powers number one and number three, four apps in Web3, right? We have Kaiching and Sweatcoin. Both of them have millions of users uh, actively on chain transacting. And so people see that and like, hey, we, you know, we want to build on, on, on the blockchain that can both scale and handle this as well as, you know, do it in seamless way. So those users don't even usually know they use Near until they want to start transacting something beyond, uh, beyond their uh, st standard app. And then at the same time is, you know, we have kind of a variety of strategies around how we want to grow startups and find new startups that want to build things as well as this more uh, partnerships that allow to bring more users into the ecosystem. So these partnerships are obviously pretty important because there's a lot of people who are not familiar with the blockchain space, Web3. I think, you know, the stat is something like 95% of people are not yet in crypto. So yeah, with probably more. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a lot, right? So with these partnerships, it creates an association to, you know, I'm the average person, I hear of Alibaba, or I hear of Cricket, or I hear of Google, it's like, ah, oh, I can put one and one and one together to equal two. And I'm like, okay, I'm starting to follow the pieces mm -hmm. a bit here. What I found when we were down in Austin, uh, at consensus, we noticed that near has tried to make a bit of a pivot away from all the blockchain terminology. And because obviously when you're in a little, uh, the blockchain bubble, you know, we all understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. When I have my girlfriend sitting next to me, she doesn't understand a word I'm saying. Right. So you guys are <laughs> making, you guys are making it a lot easier for the everyday user to be brought into the web free space. 
and made this transition to BOSS or the blockchain operating system. And we ha had a chance to kind of experiment with it. It looks really unique. Could you go a little bit deeper into what the blockchain operating system is doing and how it's kind of separating yourselves from the competition? Yeah, so maybe to start, definitely trying to, as I said, kind of the, the simplicity is not just in the user experience, it's also how we're talking about it, what, like when applications are built, how they are built as well, right? So the a lot of applications, and especially the bigger ones, they don't require you to install a wallet first. You don't require you to like create account, figure out seed phrases, all those things, right? It's kind of a smooth process. And we just released actually a FastOS SDK, which is a way for applications to embed pretty much wallet into their application. And if you have emails already in your application, you can convert them into accounts on near uh, without users even needing to do anything. And then if they enter that email anywhere else, they can recover the same account. So the idea is like really to simplify things to the level that it's actually easier than Web2, and, but it uses all the non-custodial methods. It uses cryptography on your phone. It uses meta transaction, gasless transactions underneath. It uses multi-part, like it uses all the technology, but it's behind the scenes, right? As a user, you just enter email and you have an account and you're using stuff. And then you enter this email somewhere else and you have the same account and it has the same NFTs or communities or you know tokens or whatever. And so, and so that's kind of like the motivation that we had, you know, last year as we were really um, developing this idea of blockchain operating system was that is, you know, as this kind of multi-chain world expanding, and at the same time, we saw kind of very little of actual like consumer applications that are really trying to bridge this gap, right? There was a lot of infrastructure and like we were building, you know, a part of it. Uh, and at the same time, nobody was trying to bridge that gap. And so we kind of, you know, like it was already on our vision to do that. And so we started working out what does would that look like, right? And this looks like a uh, kind of few different layers that layer on on top of the blockchain that together, you know, you need to call something. And it kind of in many ways serves as like the super app platform. In many ways it serves as like, um, you know, new blockchain stack. Uh, but, you know, it has a lot of similarity to operating systems because it has, you know, all of the kind of underlying computation layers as, as well as presentation layer, the ones that shows you user interfaces. It has identity layer. Um, it has still obviously like some social interactions, et cetera. And so that's why we call it op op like operating system. But at the same time, I think one of the ideas here is that similarly how when you buy an iPhone, you actually need to know that the thing that runs it is iOS, right? You just use your iPhone. Mm -hmm. And so the same idea here as applications are using this, the users don't need to know it runs on the blockchain operating system. They just use the application. And they don't even need to know if it runs on near, on you know, Arbitrum, Optimism, or mainnet, Ethereum. Like they can just use the application and it kind of all those things happen under the hood. And that's really what we're trying to build with this concept of blockchain operating system. It's, it's a developer platform. It spans kind of from the, you know, smart contracts to front ends. It has data layer, middleware to, pre to kind of co the process data in the right way for applications. It gives you this really easy onboarding flow that's easier than that too. It provides you with a ton of like social features as well. So you can kind of interconnect and like create things. It has, we just do these push notifications. So like a lot of those pieces that you need to build a really powerful platform and engaging application and not kind of overload your users with kind of blockchain concepts, et cetera. And so like at the end, it should, you know, you should not need to explain how this app works, right? You, people should be able to use it. Yeah, I think that's the key. You know, when, when all these, when Near Protocol or any other layer one or any crypto project really talks about onboarding the masses to crypto, talking about getting billions, millions of users into crypto, just like you said, it's it has to be, the users need to come on and use the dApps or apps and not even realize they're using blockchain because, you know, people, they just want something that runs smooth and sleek and fast. They don't necessarily need to know any of the technical details behind it. So when we're talking about consumer facing apps, you know, on this show, Josh and I, one of our specialties is always talking about narratives in crypto when it comes to different sectors of crypto that tend to get hot for certain reasons, you know, like say there was um, blockchain gaming was hot for a while and then we had uh, tokenization of real world assets and then DeFi and NFTs, all kinds of narratives are always coming and going in crypto. So what we want to know, and, and maybe you can give us a shed some light on this is, is there any sort of 
sector of crypto, any narrative or whether it's blockchain gaming, DeFi, NFTs, all that kind of stuff, that near protocol has seen a lot more development on your blockchain than the other one? Or is there one you're maybe focusing on or maybe one that you're personally more excited about going forward than others? Just maybe give us a bit, bit of an insight on that. For sure, yeah. So I think kind of from a you know, thousand uh, foot view, <laughs> the idea that Near has been built is for consumer applications, right? It is for applications that are hiding blockchain and really delivering you know, really good experience to the users and they need, you know, fast finalities, they need throughput, they need, you know, really cheap transactions, they need easy way to kind of create accounts without users needing to do all those things while, you know, readable account names and all kind of different uh, interesting functionality. And so that's really where we focused a lot of our efforts on. And, you know, again, Sweatcoin and, and Kai Ching being top apps in, in Web3 kind of showcase that. Now, specifically, I think, in, inside the consumer, right? I think loyalty payments and gaming have been, you know, probably bigger buckets where people have uh, been building on near. So Kai Ching is payments and loyalty. Sweatcoin is kind of, you know, fitness loyalty. We also have Play Ember, which is like a gaming studio with a bunch of uh, casual games and boarding as well. Uh, there's like few other like big, bigger loyalty brands and like Grupo Natresa, for example, like a big retailer in Latin America. Uh, they're building their loyalty platform so so that's kind of i would say like the core and like li lifestyle loyalty type type things been um something where we also just see web3 has product market fit right because people want to move away from you know this like locked in loyalty points that like usually you don't get don't go anywhere but actually make them more reusable and and uh, active and kind of leverage them across different platforms um, but again, I think the core idea that near been built for is for this consumer use cases. And we see this even in DeFi, the like where near's applications benefit is when it's more kind of consumer focused. And so today actually Sweatcoin announced partnership today, I mean October 3rd, <laughs> Sweatcoin announced partnership with orderly. Uh, and so now Sweatcoin users, right, that don't actually know about blockchain that much. They don't even, you know, always know they use near at that at the time. They can actually just start to trade on a DeFi platform, which is a like a full DEX, you know, resort book without knowing anything about that, right? They just have a trade button. And, and so, you know, you can see already the growth of users on orderly. And so that's kind of the idea, right? Like the, the other applications like market, D NFT marketplaces, DeFi DEXs, et cetera, they'll become infrastructure for these consumer applications. And then the users from those consumer applications just use that infrastructure without really kind of going in and understanding that always the details of, you know, exactly how DEX work, because there's other participants like, you know, professionals on the other side who are actually doing all that. Yeah, I like it. It's almost like everything, the answer to most of the questions keeps coming down to this fact that we want people to use it without really knowing they're using it. And I think that's the beauty of it. And it's really, it's really interesting to, to hear it from your mouth. That's it all, you know, whether the question is about the sectors or the operating system or the technology, the fact that you're making it easy for people to use blockchain without necessarily knowing, I think that's really cool. Yeah. And to speaking to these hot sectors and these hot narratives, I think one thing we really need to jump into here, um, you know, on hearing the way Ilya, his mind works, very forward thinking. And one of the hot sectors that we've been discussing a lot lately has been artificial intelligence. So I was reading a report on Mazari that Near Protocol was actually an AI project. Is that a machine learning project back in 2017 before making the transition to blockchain technology, a blockchain platform? So maybe you could tell us a little bit how you're thinking about artificial intelligence and integrating that into Near Protocol and how you potentially see how the Web3 space and AI are intersecting. Yeah, so, and I guess maybe to uh, talk first about my background. So my background is in artificial intelligence, machine learning research. I worked at Google Research um, for a few years. And uh, as part of it, I was part of a team that um, published a paper called Attention is All You Need, which is paper introducing transformers, which is a T for GPT, um, as people now say. But it's pretty much the core technologies that uh, started a lot of the recent AI advancements. And so when when I left Google, we started near AI. We it was near AI. We we started with uh, with the idea of teaching machines to code. 
And so it's similar to the idea of what GitHub Copilot is right now doing, um, kind of how do we be able to convert, you know, natural language descriptions into code. Now we were pretty early, like 17, the transformers just came out. It wasn't <laughs> fully ready, you know, and scaled yet. And we didn't have $300 million worth of compute uh, to do what OpenAI did. And so, but we were trying to do a lot more uh, data labeling to get better data to actually train train our uh, machine learning models. And so this is where actually we, you know, kind of uh, needed to use blockchain for our own, you know, a consumer application because um, we need to pay people around the world for the work they were doing. And, you know, many countries have their various uh, ways and kind of how to process payments. People don't have bank accounts. Like there's a lot of different complexity around that, just like just paying people for work that they've done on the internet. And so uh, we ended up looking at blockchain as like, hey, we just need to solve this problem, right? Like, can we just do that? And the answer was no, right? It didn't scale. It was too expensive, too complicated to use, et cetera. And so, so we pivoted to that, but kind of the idea, you know, behind this, like that you need this web kind of Web3 marketplace for, you know, data labeling first, but more generally for any kind of gigs and work is still there. And so there's a team working in the ecosystem on that. Um, but beyond that, kind of where AI and Web3 intersects really is um, kind of a variety of ways from more marketplaces kind of, and like where there is needs of resources, right? Right now, for example, it's really hard to get a hold of A100s, right? The GPUs you require to like fine tune, train, or uh, do inference on these models. And so a Web3 marketplace makes sense where, and actually Akash, I think, just launched that uh, kind of thing, uh, providing pretty much a way to rent it off from somebody else who has it, who doesn't need it right now, um, in the way that's like fully, fully transparent and very effective. Uh, but going beyond that, I think there's interesting cases where the I, the cryptography and methods of you know doing reputation that we're building are useful to prevent kind of the sprawl of uh, fake content and and kind of a lot of the generative uh, content that right now is starting. And it's not because it's an AI problem; it's actually a human problem, right? The mis misinformation, fake content, etc., existed for you know for since probably humanity started, yep. um, it just now AI gives like a scale to those problems. And so we need to solve, you know, this with cryptography and reputation, a way to kind of trace where the information coming from and ability to prove that it's coming from, you know, uh, reputable sources. And so all that is required to, you know, to kind of for our society to be able to get a hold of this, you know, explosion of generative content. Um, I also really excited about this idea of, I call it AI CEO. And this idea is that um, the kind of management in general is a very hard problem. And especially when we're talking about DAOs where you don't actually have hierarchy, right? And so people who are coordinators of DAOs, they, were, they needed to manage so many people at the same time. They need to give them context and board them, provide kind of, you know, prepare things for vote for decisions. And I think the, AI kind of can do a lot of that job, which is, you know, summarizing content, you know, providing context, you know, preparing the options for decisions for votes in a DAO. And so that kind of structure will be a really interesting way to really coordinate large number of individuals and organizations to achieve big ambitions. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone can agree that the future of AI, even just in Web 2 or Web 3 alone, is very exciting. There's a lot going on right now, and it seems like every month there's a new breakthrough or a new app or something that's coming out. So it's going to be interesting to see how it not only kind of transforms Web 2, but also Web 3 and blockchain. And then when you kind of, kind of take a, a bit of a closer look at the crypto market in particular right now, there's kind of, you know, it's been an interesting year and a half, to, to say it lightly. So I would, I would say, um, what, what, what are your personal thoughts on kind of the state of the crypto market? You know, obviously it's been a long time in a quote unquote bear market. Um, and what are some of the challenges that such a, a long period of, let's say, less public interest and investment presents to a project like Near Protocol? 
And where do you kind of see the market going over the next six to 12 months based on, you know, current macroeconomic trends and all that? Just kind of give us an overview of where you see the crypto market and, and some of the challenges that that presents to your project as well. Yeah, well, maybe to caveat, I'm definitely not a market analyst and <laughs> not in, my job is not to time the market, but, you know, build interesting technology and get people to use it. And so from our perspective, I mean, obviously, you know, the less interest, less investment means, you know, less founders building uh, one way or another, which means we have less kind of startups that are experimenting the space and, and leverage this technology to build something useful for users. At the same time, there's still, you know, a kind of fair bit of startups who are continue doing this. They've got funded um, and, uh, and are continue pushing and innovating in the space. And so now it's becoming a question um, are we attractive for them? Do we have value to offer uh, versus maybe before it was kind of a really fast expanding market. And so it was, you know, it was more about attracting inbound versus figuring out the kind of with existing founders where like, what are the value offer? And so from this perspective, that's why we have actually been working more on the system because we kind of really went deeper with the market that exists and understanding what problems they have and how can we solve them, right? Oh, the problem is actually the engagement of the users who are using right now Web3 is very low because, you know, after you connected your MetaMask, there's no way to re-engage you, right? After you connected the kind of any other Web3 wallet, there's no way to re-engage you. There's no way to uh, bring news to you to tell you that something changed in your portfolio, right? So this is where, hey, we need notifications that are like, you know, privacy preserving, contr controllable by the user, but at the same time, the developers and applications are able to communicate with the user. Same thing is like, hey, the, like the cost of acquisition for these startups is huge, right? That bringing new users is extremely expensive. You either do airdrops or, you know, you're trying to buy users pretty much on these platforms. And it's because it's like really hard to onboard new users that are kind of coming in uh, fresh. And so, like, well, let's solve this problem. Let's also figure out what, you know, how do we link in on ramping into this sensitive experience? So like, I would say like the, you know, in the challenge of that market is not expanding dramatically, but, you know, uh, the opportunity is now to really focus the value kind of that platform offers more on the problems that those startups have and offer them a more kind of robust package of, of things. And again, blockchain every system is really that, Kind of idea that like hey we want to offer more than just what layer one is but the whole slew of tools to do that right okay well so even given that fact and we know that kind of the crypto market is in kind of you know a sleepier time than maybe it was a year and a half ago i did recently read that the the amount of activity on chain users transactions activity on your protocol is actually i think it was as of september uh, last month the the activity was the highest that it's been in a very long time. So first of all, congratulations. And second of all, is there any specific reason that these stats have, have upticked like that? Like, did you guys launch something that brought a lot of new people on or kind of what happened there? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the reality is also the kind of the cycle of development is, um, you know, not instant. Like, let's say, you know, somebody's starting to develop an application or existing applications with users starting to integrate near, it can take anywhere from like six to 12 months to get that going. And so uh, specifically in September, there's like few applications that launched or and few integrations that launched, but specifically the application called Kai Ching, the, as I said, number one application right now in Web3 has launched in September. And so they bringing millions of their users to start transacting and they pretty much switched from using Stripe right, where you pay, like, uh, I, I forgot the exact numbers, like 25 or 30 cents per transaction, and like 2.5% to near, which is subcent uh, transaction fees, you know, and one second finality, where Stripe is, you know, one to two weeks. Um, so that's a pretty dramatic change. Yeah. And so, so they, they kind of see both, you know, improvement on their metrics, as well as they, you know, ready to go to grow to more users with that. And so, so that's probably one of the biggest drivers, but also there's like few applic other applications uh, launched and then uh, existing applications are growing as well. It's so all together that kind of, you know, contributed to that effect of, uh, 
uh, you know, yeah, we are like, we are, I think have more active daily active users than the Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism combined or something. Wow. That's Impressive. wild. Yeah, crazy. That's excellent to hear. I mean, look, you're forming the partnerships, you're seeing the integrations, all wonderful things for near protocol. And you made a really interesting point there about the bear market and how there's not a lot of startups, maybe, maybe not as many startups. So kind of gives you guys a bit of a head start, if you will. And I view Nier as like one of the OGs, you know, especially when you've started to bring it up, uh, yeah, re okay. referring to the sharding technology yeah. and all that stuff, uh, which is groundbreaking. Mm. Um, I'm wondering, what are you hoping to see Nier grow into over the next, let's say, five, five years or so? And what do you see the blockchain landscape growing into as well over that period of time? Is it like in the 1970s when everybody thought that we'd be in flying cars in 2020? <laughs> Are you seeing like this huge, like, oh my God, everything's web three, or are you seeing a little bit, something maybe a bit slower and realistic? <laughs> well, you know, maybe I'm, I'm optimist and, and impatient person in general. So, uh, <laughs> I think, I think we'll, we'll sit, we'll start seeing kind of some acceleration happening because of, as I said, there's like the cycle of build out and growth, um, like there's went a lot of resources and effort to kind of integrate and bring a lot of things on chain. Uh, and again, like not everything makes sense, right? And I mean, you know, people try to do not uh, things that don't work, right? But there's some things that actually do work, right? And this is everything from payments to loyalty to kind of, you know, tracking assets to understanding and, and interacting with people. And also there is a, things that go beyond that, right? Which are Maybe you don't need to put everything on chain, but it's useful to have on chain information, which is again, like reputation and like, you don't need to put the content itself always on chain, but you can, uh, and that allows you to start doing a very interesting things on top of it. And so including, we actually like with blockchain every system with, with the front ends itself, we put the co source code of the front end on the blockchain. And this kind of, in a way we, you know, we made Git, like GitHub on near. And what this allows to do is to do now new things around composability of front ends of, you know, like forkability of uh, any application you use and, you know, integration of this cryptographic authentication, a way to verify that the front end you use is indeed the front end that, for example, the original team has published and not been hacked. So there's the new properties that come in with that. So I think we'll see kind of a, a mix of, um, Web two applications that have a Web three sliver, right? Like we'll see kind of companies that use maybe payments, maybe loyalty, maybe they'll use part of the, their front end in this new way. Maybe they'll have you know a way like a social profile that comes now from the blockchain instead of from Facebook, right? Which you know closed API or whatever. And so like that, like I'm very sure we'll see more and more happening because it, it actually provides like a you know more robust system for doing those things uh now will every single business become web3 and like you know launch a token and turn into uh you know a dgen uh, crypto <laughs> crypto community probably not right <laughs> i'm pretty sure like factory is going to continue to produce you know cars and whatnot and they're not going to be like a token run community community project so so i think like it will be kind of integration throughout the stack uh, but I do think the important part is, and we need to continue innovating is governance. And I think, um, you know, we already see some of the kind of failures in governance in, in the traditional world. We also see, you know, we're still figuring out how to do governance in Web3 world. And we had a really interesting experiment with one vote, kind of one person, one vote on near that just finished, um, uh, like a week ago. Uh, and so like, we'll need to continue innovating, but I think that is a really important part because as this internet becomes more complex, as, as more value and uh, kind of is moved here as well, the governance will become a really important part because it will be, be driving resource allocation across the world. And I think that is where things are both really interesting, but and also right now is still pretty challenging. And we, you know, again, some of the failures from last, you know, last year and year before has been because of the governance. Nice. Uh, or lack of it, right? Yeah, and so, yeah. Interesting. It's it's well when we mentioned um, like Web two companies moving into Web three or even adding a Web three sliver to their their product offering. It kind of it reminded me of that the recent um, leak that we were discussing about uh, mm. how the Microsoft and 
the next version of Xbox, there was a leak that apparently it might have crypto wallets integrated into the next Xbox or, you know, people have, you know, put theories out that the next PlayStation might have, you know, MetaMask or EVM compatibility or crypto compatibility. And it just certain some of those Web2 sectors like gaming, I feel like it makes a lot of sense for them to, to integrate blockchain technology into it. Because as you said, you mentioned earlier, people want, you know, interoperability between if it's their loyalty program or if it's their in-game NFTs. So that could be interesting. But speaking back more towards near. And even though you kind of just gave us the, you know, high level five to 10 year, you know, vision of where blockchain technology can come into society, put your kind of hat on and speak to the near protocol community. And maybe if you can give us some insight into your upcoming roadmap over the next six to 12 months, what are some of, I mean, obviously near protocol has been delivering like very well during the bear market. We've already kind of touched upon all the great things that you've built, but is there anything, any big milestones, cool things in the roadmap that people can get excited about that they're going to see maybe within the next six to 12 months that you can share with us today? Yeah, so I'll preface it that you guys all should come to NearCon in Lisbon, November 7 to 10, and you'll learn a lot more what's happening with the roadmap. And you can also talk with folks who are making it happen. Uh, But the thing to mention right now that kind of we, you know, uh, from the things we've briefly talked about. So, I mean, the near as a blockchain itself, right? It continues on its roadmap to, you know, um, improve on the sharding uh, and, you know, a- enable that to scale more while maintaining security. And so, again, we'll talk more about it at NearCon with like some interesting developments there. Uh, but that that in itself is really, you know, important to continue providing this core ba- basic, you know, scalability at you know, fast speed while, you know, continue being simple. Now, uh, we just announced FastOS SDK. So this is a way for people to integrate, uh, kind of just, you know, log in with email into your app and that creates account and it's fully non-custodial and it's recoverable through email. And you can then add other devices and other ways of recovery as well. Uh, But what's interesting about that idea is that we want to expand it to work with other blockchains. So right now this is a near account, but what we're working on is that you are able to uh, through near to transact on other blockchains. So in a way, similarly, how you log into Coinbase or Binance and you have addresses on different chains, which you can receive, but you cannot do anything with them. So you'll have similar thing. You have a near account, but it will have addresses on other chains and you will be able to interact with applications of those chains through that address. And so what this allows to do now is again, abstract out the, like where on which chain the application smart contract is, and you can just use it given this like fast OS account that, that you'll have. And so that allows again, to, to further our idea of the, uh, of, of kind of unifying this layer for consumers to use blockchain applications. And so that is like a pretty big milestone that we're working toward kind of there's a lot of, you know, pieces down like toward it. Uh, And we're going to be talking again, way more about it at NearCon, but it's a really big kind of shift in the web three where before you need like a wallet on every chain. Right. Mm -hmm. And even if it's like a MetaMask, you still need like, you know, go and switch networks and, you know, figure out you have gas and do all those things. And so we're trying to abstract all of that out gasless transactions, you know, kind of mapped wallets between different chains, including Bitcoin. Uh, so you'll be able to do that. And so that allows to kind of add in your account, including smart contracts to become this like multi-chain uh, act- actors. Yeah. By making things easy, as you just outlined throughout this entire interview, it seems as though near and yourself are on the path to truly onboarding the next 1 billion people into web three. So we appreciate having you on today, Ilya. It was very informative. Mm. And I think ourselves, in addition to our listeners and anybody who's new to learning about the NEAR protocol and what you guys are up to, uh, really appreciate it as well. Yeah, thanks for coming on. That was a really, really informative interview. Thanks, guys. Thanks awesome. Like hey, well, if uh, if anybody, um, you know, if you're a NEAR protocol follower, if there's anything else you want us to um, cover it going forward, you know, we always talk about this project, let us know in the comments and make sure to like and subscribe for similar content. And then tune into the next episode. That one is going to be a banger.